This is a fragment entering the lower atmosphere. Three, two, one, an impact. What is the explosion? It's a chunk of rock. Rocks don't explode. <laughs> yeah, tell that to the dinosaurs. The sky's on fire. Come on, let's go. With the largest fragment expected to hit in less than 24 hours, space agencies are expecting an extinction-level event. The greatest chance of survival are the bunkers in Greenland. Where we're gonna go? Gotta go now. Okay. What is it? What's going on? Train derailed across the highway. If you are hearing this broadcast, seek shelter immediately. What do you think it is? No idea. Oh my god, John, go! Shut in the back! Cover, Nathan! You're such a brave guy, you know that? I swear I will get us under those bunkers. Because we're always gonna be together. Go, go, go! <laughs> I'm explaining a film from 2020 titled Greenland. Spoilers ahead. Enjoy the content. The scene begins with the news about meteors causing an apocalypse on Earth. This is John Garrity, a father and engineer, Alison Garrity, the wife and mother of Nathan Garrity, their only son, he apparently suffers from diabetes. This was a memorable day for John. He had just returned home from work when he heard the news on the radio about a comet found by NASA a week before. Clark is not just any comet, it hails from a different solar system. It has also been established that this is the closest comet to Earth in history, thus it will be quite visible even during the day. When John got home, he was met by Allie, his wife's nickname, who was working out. Their connection appeared to be strained. A moment later Nathan came, this child was really unfortunate, he had to use a device installed in his stomach to control his diabetes. While watching the news on TV about Clark's Comet, they found out that this comet was made up of rocks and ice that had been destroyed millions of years ago. The next morning they prepared to watch the comet with their neighbors, before that John and Nathan went to the supermarket first to buy some necessary things. There were several fighter planes in the sky, as well as a comet coming towards Earth. While they were shopping, John received a security message from the security department informing him that he and his family had been chosen to be transported to the emergency shelter. When John returned home, he quickly informed Ali that there was a problem with the comet. While the news on TV revealed that comet parts had landed into the Atlantic Ocean, John looked outside and noticed a tremendous wave that immediately wrecked the houses surrounding him. Apparently it was a fragment of a comet that had hit Florida even though according to previous predictions it would fall around Bermuda. It appears that the explosive effect of the comet is capable of destroying the entire city. John receives another communication from the president but the other residents do not, which confuses them. John was told to report to Robbins Air Base right away, and that he and his family would leave for the evacuation location at 9.45 p.m. They quickly packed all of the necessary supplies, the most crucial of which was Nathan's medication. The sky was crimson and frightening as they were ready to go. The neighbors who were watching could only beg to be taken away, some even begging so that John could at least take their children. John was forced to leave because he was only allowed to bring his family. The road was very congested. John attempted to locate an alternate way, but this caused Nathan to worry, so he had to seek for his favorite blanket in his luggage, but the bag collapsed. During the journey, it was reported on the radio that Comet Clark pieces had impacted other areas. NASA was concerned that a huge comet fragment may inflict catastrophic damage to Earth. The components of the comet are scheduled to impact Earth in less than 48 hours. Because the truck was overcrowded and the route was impassable, John and his family were forced to walk the rest of the way. Arriving at the gate, John was directed by security officers to go to Hangar 33, where they were given identification bracelets. John was carrying lots of bags while the authorities only allowed each family to bring one bag, they were forced to repack and then they realized that Nathan's medicine bag was not there. 
There were still about 15 to 20 minutes before the flight, before that John took his medicine bag. First. Because Allie was afraid that John wouldn't have time to take it, she tried to tell the soldier that her husband was taking medicine. Even though the medication was insulin for diabetes, Allie and Nathan were nevertheless advised to accompany them. Ali was warned that those with chronic conditions should not participate in the evacuation. When John went home after taking the prescription, he was surprised to discover his wife and child missing. When John entered the plane but still couldn't find them, someone noticed him carrying a bag of medicine and informed him that persons with chronic illnesses were not permitted to depart. John decided to get off the plane, but he was surprised because there were so many people who weren't supposed to be on board but were instead evacuated, not to mention the people who were still outside who forced their way into the plane, chaos was inevitable and then the soldiers shot at them. The resulting chaos caused the fuel on the plane to spill and of course caused the plane to explode. John then returned to the car and found a note from Allie saying that she and Nathan were going to his father's house in Kentucky. Meanwhile, Allie, who was on her way, stopped at the drugstore to pick up some medicine that could be used for Nathan. Suddenly armed looters came, luckily they released Allie and Nathan. They were also lucky to get a ride from Ralph and Judy, that night the sky was clear, making the comet fragments clearly visible. John then sought for a tall structure to look for a signal, climbing to the roof and finding many people resting and drinking while watching the comets crash to earth. John attempted to contact Allie, but his smartphone still did not receive a signal. John rode out with the others, one of them was Colin. Colin stated that individuals that were evacuated were those who were valuable, such as his mother, who was picked because she was a doctor. Returning to John, who was still traveling with Ralph, he abruptly halted the automobile with the intent of kidnapping Nathan and transporting him to another evacuation airport. He would pretend to be Nathan's parents, so that the authorities would allow him to board the plane. Then someone asked for John's bracelet, because it was registered, John couldn't give it to him and a commotion broke out. As a result of the commotion, the car swerved, causing all the passengers to fly out, so John was forced to kill the person for his own safety. As the night went on the sky became more and more scary, while Allie was already feeling hopeless because John hadn't come, luckily someone offered a lift to Knoxville meanwhile, at another airport, Ralph and Judy pose as Nathan's parents while carrying him. Ralph told the officer as he was about to pass by that his and his wife's bracelets had been stolen, so only Nathan was wearing them. When Nathan ventured to assert that they were not his parents and that he was being abducted, the authorities imprisoned Ralph and Judy while Nathan was detained. Then Allie yelled angrily that her son had been stolen and was about to board an aircraft through this airport. Allie was directed to the tent to look for her son. Luckily, Allie managed to find Nathan and, even though he was being treated by the authorities, they were also given a lift using a military bus. In addition, Allie was provided medical supplies for Nathan. The next day, John watched on TV that the calamity had taken the lives of millions of people, and that fragments of a bigger comet would strike the earth in less than 24 hours. Finally, John went to Dale's house, his father-in-law's residence. After Ali called and requested to be picked up, John and Dale quickly went to pick them up, and they finally met again. They all went into the house and immediately watched the news on TV, where it was reported that tomorrow at approximately 8.45 in the morning, the comet fragments would hit North Africa and Europe. Those chosen for evacuation will be transported to bunkers near the Thule airfield in Greenland. Colin's statements that he could send him to Canada via a pilot at Oscott Airport stayed with John. Dale was also invited, but he declined. 
He also warned John not to repeat his bad behaviors, including cheating. John maintained that he had changed and was now doing his best by spending time with his family. A few seconds later, comet fragments begin to fall around them, they must escape immediately, and Dale instructs them to take his car. Suddenly there was another warning that the comet fragments would rain down on the area. Sure enough, a moment later a meteor shower hit the area so everyone panicked and ran away to save themselves. It was evening and things were starting to become safe, they continued their journey to Canada with six hours left before destruction. Meanwhile on the radio there was the latest information that the comet fragments were apparently larger in size than the asteroid that destroyed the Earth during the time of the dinosaurs, the impact of this impact would cause an earthquake and a tsunami as high as 1,000 feet. Not to mention the wind, which is faster than the speed of sound and may blast temperatures of over 900 degrees Celsius. They eventually got to Oscott Airport, but the final jet was ready to take off, so John pursued it down at high speed, causing the planes to spin around and face each other. According to the officials on the plane, they couldn't fly since the plane was full. After a heated debate, they were ultimately permitted to go on the condition that they didn't carry any products for fear of the plane being overcrowded. They boarded the plane and were met by those who had arrived early. They finally arrived in Greenland but suddenly there was a shock and it turned out that a comet fragment had fallen off the coast there. The shock wave was able to blow away their plane, causing the plane to be damaged and lose its balance. Fortunately, the jet landed despite colliding with a mountain and killing the pilot. They had to race there when John noticed a military jet about a mile distant, thankfully, the military saw them and picked them up in a truck. When they got at the bunker complex, the largest comet fragment was seen and poised to strike the earth, the shock wave would reach them in another 30 seconds, there was nothing they could do except pray. Now it's simply a matter of waiting for the end. The story proceeds to nine months later at the end of the scene. It can be seen that all cities in the world have been destroyed, Sydney, Chicago, Paris, Mexico City, all of them have been destroyed and only rubble remains. While the survivors in the Greenland bunker used radio to try to find other survivors, they hoped that there were more survivors than those in Greenland. Someone apparently responded to the radio appeal, first from Helsinki and subsequently from several locations across the world. When they opened the bunker entrance, they were astounded to see that the Earth had been decimated by the impact of this huge comet. But now that everything is safe and the radiation from the comet has disappeared, for these survivors they have to start everything from zero again, as this film ends. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to stay updated with recaps of our latest films. Your support would be appreciated. I hope to see you next time.